Hi everyone, Peter here from Flow High Performance, and in this video we will cover how volume should be allocated to each muscle group. First, let's quickly define what volume is. This topic has been covered extensively in other videos, so we won't go into too much detail. Essentially, when we talk about hypertrophy training, volume refers to the total number of sets performed per muscle group per week. This recent research review confirmed that using total number of sets was an adequate way to quantify volume for hypertrophy training. It was concluded that if sets are taken close to failure and rep ranges lie within around 6 to 20 reps per set, then the total number of sets performed per muscle group per week is an adequate way to quantify volume specifically for hypertrophy training. This is because it has been well established that hypertrophy can be equally achieved using different rep ranges, loads, and different exercises for the same muscle group. This means that the classic form of quantifying volume, which is to use volume load, or total tonnage, is not a very accurate way to calculate and compare training volume for hypertrophy. This is because volume load uses the metric of sets times reps times load of each exercise, which isn't necessarily indicative of the hypertrophic stimulus. For example, let's compare the volume load of two different exercises. Let's say a trainee performs three sets of 12 with 25 kilos in each hand for the dumbbell bench press. In another session, let's say the same trainee performs three sets of eight with 70 kilos for the barbell bench press. While both of these protocols would probably achieve very similar hypertrophy outcomes, the volume load between exercises would be quite drastically different. For the dumbbell bench press, we have 3 times 12 times 50 kilos, which equals a volume load of 1,800 total kilograms lifted. For the barbell bench press, the volume load would be 3 times 8 times 70 kilos, which equals 1,680 total kilograms lifted. So despite the difference in volume load, the hypertrophy outcomes would be pretty much the same. Therefore, it is best to use total number of sets per muscle group per week, as a simple and accurate measure of volume for hypertrophy training. Volume load could be used as an intercession metric to compare performance over time, but it is not the best way to calculate total volume. So how does volume influence hypertrophy? Once again, this is a topic that has been covered extensively in other videos on this channel, so we will only be brief in our discussion of this. Essentially, volume appears to follow a dose-response relationship with hypertrophy. This means that the more volume we perform for a given muscle group, the more muscle growth we see. This meta-analysis analyzed the current evidence assessing the influence of volume on muscle growth. A clear dose response was found, whereby more volume resulted in more muscle growth. However, most of the research included in this meta-analysis used volumes that wouldn't really be considered very high for hypertrophy training enthusiasts. So the question is, do very high volumes result in further muscle growth? Or is there a point at which more volume results in less muscle growth? Fortunately, since this meta-analysis was published, we have had more research exploring the effects of very high volumes, even what would be considered very high in the resistance training community, and how they influence muscle growth. This study directly explored the effects of different training volumes on muscle hypertrophy. In this study, trainees performed a full-body resistance training program with different volumes. One group performed 16 sets per muscle group per week, one group trained with 24 sets per muscle group per week, and another group with 32 weekly sets. At the end of the 8-week study, the same dose response was seen for all muscle groups. The group training with 32 weekly sets saw the most muscle growth, followed by 24 sets, followed by 16 sets. So even with these very high volumes, volumes still seem to follow a dose response relationship. Furthermore, this study also explored the effects of training with very high volumes on muscle growth. Trainees performed the same full body resistance training program for eight weeks with different volumes. One group performed one set for each exercise in each session, another group performed three sets per exercise per session, and the last group performed five sets per exercise per session. In the high volume training group, some muscles were trained with up to 45 sets per week, which is undoubtedly extreme levels of volume. Once again, it was found that training with more volume even with these extremely high volumes, resulted in superior muscle growth. This research all suggests that volume seems to be one of the most important variables for hypertrophy training. As we perform more volume, we generally see greater muscle growth. This dose response also seems to continue, even with very high training volumes. 
However, in reality, our total weekly training volume will be limited to some extent. We cannot infinitely increase volume and see greater muscle growth. There are three factors that are likely to limit how much volume we can train with. We will now cover what these are and how they may limit volume. The first is joint tolerance. This refers to how much work the joints and connective tissue can handle before experiencing some sort of pain or irritation. Inevitably, there is a threshold as to how much stress each joint can tolerate, and surpassing this threshold will result in some form of pain or irritation over time. While there are other factors which contribute to joint stress too, total weekly workload, in other words volume, is a major contributing factor. So basically, trainees should respect the tolerance of each joint and ensure weekly volume isn't so high that it exceeds their recovery capacity. Training with volumes beyond this threshold will likely result in injury over the long term. The second potential limiting factor is systemic fatigue. Systemic fatigue is not a well-defined phenomenon, but it can be generally described as fatigue of the entire organism. This affects all bodily systems and is non-specific. This means that all forms of stress contribute to systemic fatigue and it has effects on many bodily functions. While all forms of stress contribute to systemic fatigue, training volume plays a major role. Ultimately, there is a finite amount of stress each individual can handle per week before our systemic capacity is breached. A chronic breach in our systemic capacity may manifest as an increased risk of illness, increased lethargy, poor sleep, and decreased lifting performance. Simply put, we only have a limited amount of total volume we can perform each week before breaching our systemic capacity. And the last factor which may limit training volume is practicality. This refers to the practical aspect of training. We all have lives outside of the gym, and often this can determine how much volume we can perform in a week. Trainees may be time restricted in how much they can train, and naturally this will only allow for a certain amount of volume to be performed. This may be due to family commitments, work, other sports, social activity, or simply just personal preference. So even if we can handle more volume from a joint tolerance and systemic perspective, the practical side of our lives may limit training time. Some people may have very few other commitments, enjoy spending time in the gym, and essentially have unlimited time to train. For these trainees, practicality may not be as much of a concern. So while more volume seems to result in greater muscle growth, there are limitations to how much we can perform each week. However, trainees should probably try to maximize how much volume they can perform within these constraints. This will allow us to maximize muscle growth within the specific context of each individual. So now we understand that inevitably, there is a finite amount of volume we can perform each week. Because of this, we should be strategic with our volume allocation. This refers to how much volume we distribute to each muscle group. There are three primary factors which will determine how much volume we perform for each muscle group within our constraints. Let's now cover what these are. First is your individual strengths and weaknesses in terms of muscular development. Each trainee generally has certain muscle groups that are naturally more developed and others that are less developed. So to achieve a balanced physique, Trainees may want to perform more volume for their less developed muscle groups to experience a faster rate of growth. And then on the other hand, trainees may want to perform less volume for the more naturally developed muscles to experience a slower rate of growth, while the weaker muscle groups catch up. The second factor to consider is the responsiveness of each muscle group. Different muscle groups are likely to respond differently to resistance training, even for the same individual. This means some muscle groups may see a faster rate of growth than others, even with the same volume for both muscles. Therefore, trainees may want to allocate more volume to the muscle groups that have a poorer response and less volume to those which seem to be highly responsive. And the last factor which will influence volume allocation is personal preference. Different lifters may want to grow specific muscle groups more than others. If a trainee wants to emphasize a specific muscle group, then they can train that muscle with more volume to see a faster rate of growth. For the muscle groups they aren't as concerned with emphasizing, trainees can perform less volume to see a slightly slower rate of growth. Furthermore, trainees may not even want to train some muscle groups at all. In this case, they don't have to train that muscle group if they don't want to. This is completely up to the individual to determine. So as we now understand, volume should be allocated based on these three factors. Let's now cover some examples of how volume can be allocated in different ways. First, let's explore a general balanced volume distribution. 
Once again, exact volumes are going to be highly individual based on the limiting factors we discussed. However, for this example trainee, let's say these volumes are appropriate. As we can see, we've implemented 12 sets for the chest, back, quads, hamstrings and glutes, and 8 direct sets for the delts, biceps, triceps and calves. This is a fairly balanced volume distribution for someone who may not have any specific strengths or weaknesses and doesn't want to particularly emphasize any specific muscle group. Let's now take this same trainee and reallocate their volume in a way to emphasize the upper body. So the overall training volume may not be much different, but the distribution will be. As we can see here, we have allocated 16 sets to the chest and back, 8 sets for the quads, hamstrings and glutes, 12 direct sets for the delts, biceps and triceps, and 4 sets for the calves. So quite clearly, we have allocated more volume for the chest, back, delts, biceps and triceps, and less volume for the quads, hamstrings, glutes and calves. In this next example, let's take this same trainee and reallocate their volume to emphasize the lower body. Once again, the overall weekly volume isn't going to be much different, just the distribution will change. As we can see, we have 8 sets for the chest and back, 16 sets for the quads, hamstrings and glutes, 4 direct sets for the delts, biceps and triceps, and 12 sets for the calves. So clearly we have allocated more volume for the quads, hamstrings, glutes and calves, and less volume for the chest, back, delts, biceps and triceps. And for this last example, we will distribute volume based on the specific strengths and weaknesses of an example trainee. Let's say that this trainee's most developed muscle groups are their hamstrings, glutes, delts and triceps. The muscles which are moderately developed are their chest, back and quads, and the muscle groups which are the weakest in comparison are the biceps and calves. So in this example, let's allocate volume in a way that emphasizes the less developed muscles and de-emphasizes the more developed muscles. As we can see here, we have 12 sets for the chest, back and quads, 8 sets for the hamstrings and glutes, 4 direct sets for the delts, 12 direct sets for the biceps, 4 direct sets for the triceps, and 12 direct sets for the calves. So here the volume allocation is individualized to the specific strengths and weaknesses for this trainee. Ultimately, each individual should adjust their volume based on individual context. Furthermore, this volume allocation can change over time based on how the trainee is developing and responding to the training protocol. Thanks for watching and hopefully you got something out of this video. Remember to subscribe if you haven't already.